Hello and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from. Welcome to today's webinar, the four simple principles to get your API governance program off the ground. My name is Dan Gordon. I am lead, uh, I lead the technical evangelist team here at Traceable AI. I'm excited to welcome today's speaker, uh, Renata Budko. Renata is Traceable's head of product. Renata, over to you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'm Renata Butko. As Dan said, I am a head of product at uh, Traceable AI. I've been in product management for quite some time, uh, actually going on 20 years now. Uh, and uh, I am uh, happy to talk both to customers and to engineers. Uh, and recently, a lot of uh, the engineers that I talk to are interested in uh, managing solutions and applications in the cloud. So the topic that we are covering today is near and dear both to my heart and to the heart of many of uh, our customers. And uh, that is discovering, managing, and governing uh, various APIs that make up cloud applications. What are the business challenges uh, going into the cloud around governing and, uh, and the APIs? Uh, I wouldn't uh, uh, I wouldn't be able to say better uh, than how the community put it as a part of the cloud security alliances uh, initiative as you move from the monolithic to the API driven applications in the cloud uh, the challenges uh, that come up are lack of control uh, lack of visibility lack of manageability a uh, loss of uh, governance, uh, risks of not compliance, failure to isolate both between the individual microservices and from the microservice to uh, the host of the container or node, and of course, data protection. So all of those challenges taken together is why the API-driven applications need both new strategy and new processes on uh, how you approach uh, governance uh, and uh, asset catalog management in this new environment. Uh, so uh, rather than trying to boil the ocean, uh, today I want to share with you uh, for simple principles uh, on uh, how to get your API governance program off the ground. Uh, before we dive into the how, uh, a little bit on the why. We have all qualitatively known uh, that the introduction of APIs uh, have led to the new threat surfaces and new risks. Uh, but to put some numbers to this game, I um, would like to point you to a survey uh, that has been done annually uh, by uh, another great player in the market, F5. Uh, and what they have seen in terms of the number of incidents and the breaches, uh, that uh, uh, those security incidents that result uh, in API uh, issues or are driven from uh, the lack of governance in the APIs. Uh, that uh, uh, is uh, five times as high uh, in 2020 as what we have seen only two years ago in 2018. Uh, so uh, risks of not managing the APIs and not securing APIs are definitely very high and growing exponentially. Uh, another uh, great player in the market that also does uh, uh, research regularly, uh, IBM, uh, tells us that the shadow APIs and emerging unauthorized system uh, result in more than half of uh, all the issues that we have seen in cloud breaches. Uh, APIs are important. Uh, so in terms of uh, 
frequency of the attacks uh, based on your APIs. Uh, this is a little pop quiz for you guys. Uh, do you think the most frequent attacks are ransomware, API abuse, phishing, or insider threats? I'll give you a second to think about that. API abuse is the most frequent one. At least that's what Gartner tells us. Uh, so one more question for our pop quiz. What percentage of the web traffic is via the APIs? This will uh, give us a better understanding of whether APIs are actually important. Uh, so 36%, 56%, 83%, or 95%. There you go, 83% of all the traffic goes via APIs. So we can see uh, that uh, single page applications, mobile applications, and all the new age things are rapidly taking over from the uh, old uh, monolithic and multi-page HTTP applications. And if your APIs are not protected, uh, you are in a world of, world of hurt. Uh, there are a couple of examples here on what happens if the API governance is not implemented. Uh, uh, T-Mobile has lost 20 million records because of a shadow API uh, that uh, they had exposed in 2018. And of course, it hasn't been discovered for a long time. Uh, so uh, not monitoring your APIs uh, is incrementally uh, increasing the damage that a particular vulnerability uh, might be able to inflict. Uh, another example here, uh, I don't want to uh, name names, uh, but we uh, have seen uh, a 10x increase in login volumes uh, for that vendor. Uh, also with a shadow X API exposed. And uh, in this case, the result was both a denial of service and a compromise of a user account. And it's all because of improper asset management uh, and improper monitoring. So how do we get APIs under control? The questions uh, that you have probably all asked yourself what are the applications that we even have in our environment? If so, are they on AWS? Are they on GCP? Are they on DigitalOcean? Are they on some other cloud? What services uh, implement each of the applications and what business purpose do they serve? Who is the development team? If something goes wrong with that API, who am I going to go ask or assign the Jira to? Uh, then uh, as companies grow and bring API into more of the production environments, what are the change control policies and other policies that are required for that API lifecycle? Uh, are those policies driven by uh, the compliance requirements of the applications that the APIs implement? Or what are the risks of non-compliance within those policies and how are they different in production and pre-production environments. But then in terms of risks, uh, what is an acceptable risk for external and internal APIs? How do I know that the risk is acceptable? Who is my decision maker on that? How can I reduce the risk and uh, decrease the vulnerabilities uh, within a particular API? Oh, what kind of data uh, API touch and does that change the compliance policies? Uh, what is in scope and what is not in scope, especially for uh, the policies like PCI DSS uh, and um, HIPAA high tech, the scope uh, of compliance is extremely important to both the cost of, cost of audit uh, and the overall risk. And then last but not least, in terms of my usage patterns and the users that access my APIs, do 
although we see the users that are trying to abuse the APIs and access them in a different way that was not intended by a developer. A way to answer most of these questions is with continuous visibility, assessment, and remediation. Uh, so to put it succinctly, uh, you summarize, correlate, visualize, draw conclusions, and automate actions based on those conclusions. Uh, that's all great in theory, but how do we approach this? Where do we get started? Uh, you get started with four simple principles. You first catalog what you have. Then you establish what are the compliance regulations that are relevant to your industry and to your particular applications. Uh, you establish the change policy and then you monitor that whatever changes the APIs experience still comply with the change policy. So one by one, know your APIs and their owners. Uh, that is probably the first principle of cataloging, uh, being able to list all your assets and of course API and microservice is nothing more than a software asset. So things that you want to catalog uh, within, uh, within that, uh, of course, APIs themselves, uh, including the uh, Swagger or open API definitions of each API and which service they belong to. Applications uh, that the services belong to, how are the services grouped uh, into, for example, a payment application? Uh, or a currency converting applications. There are typically multiple services that implement it, but if you know how the services relate to each other for a business purpose, uh, that helps to establish and monitor policy. Uh, then uh, platform discovery, spec upload and service ownership are, are the other aspects that you want to monitor for. Uh, once your APIs and applications are in the catalog, uh, you want to compare uh, the discovered specifications with the specifications that your developers have provided. And of course, once you know who owns the particular code or the particular applications, uh, you know who uh, is responsible and how to remediate the problems if we see any issues there. And uh, of course, in terms of establishing the policy, it helps uh, to be able to classify uh, the applications and the services and the APIs that uh, constitute those applications uh, into specific categories. Uh, here, you can establish policies for documentation, policies for data handling, and policies for uh, accessing and managing uh, these APIs and applications and how the uh, users, authenticated and authorized users, uh, figure into who can use, access, and manage those. Uh, so simple, seemingly simple principle, uh, but probably the most fundamental uh, in establishing your API governance. Principle number two, uh, know the compliance regulations that are relevant to your APIs. Uh, I've mentioned PCI DSS and HIPAA uh, uh, previously. Of course, PCI DSS for payment card industry, typically relevant to uh, e-commerce and any of the financial technologies applications. I, a HIPAA and the corresponding high tech requirements is for health information. Uh, interestingly, uh, GDPR uh, is relatively new, uh, maybe for the last uh, couple, three years. Uh, we have privacy regulations coming, coming out of the European Union and uh, any SaaS company uh, who has has users of um, EU citizenship. 
or EU residency has to have to implement uh, the compliance uh, requirements in line with GDPR. Uh, because we are all online today, uh, just because your headquarters are in Arkansas, unfortunately, it does not mean that you can avoid uh, GDPR compliance because you can have customers logging into your uh, website from Paris uh, and thus be subject to GDPR compliance and very high fines for non-compliance. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned earlier today was Cloud Security Alliance, and uh, uh, that is because uh, being cloud focused, this body, uh, this organization uh, has helped us by introducing a very specific controls uh, that we can uh, reference and use as best practice in anything API related. Uh, and Cloud Security Alliance is what I wanted to emphasize today uh, because it's so easy to interpret in API-driven applications. Uh, if you look at the CSA compliance uh, recommendations, uh, they tend to, uh, to get broken into a very clear and easy to understand sections. Uh, so the first one I'm referencing here is application and interface security. That's section I AIS. Uh, the next you want to look at is uh, audit assurance and compliance, uh, also relevant to most APIs. A change control is a policy that you will want to establish to see what is a legitimate a legitimate change and uh, uh, how it affects your uh, SLAs and the security posture of the applications. And then of course, who should uh, approve the change and what kind of processes it needs to go through, especially in our agile flexible environments where you have um, uh, CICD uh, deploying changes in your applications on hourly basis. Uh, the controls in the APIs, the need for the APIs to be backward compatible in many cases, uh, that makes this policy very important uh, to find and strike the balance uh, between the stability and reduce risk uh, in, uh, in the fast changing environment is a very, uh, very important aspect of the, of the API policy. And of course, you only want to go as far as your compliance requires and your corporate policies require. Uh, so this, this is an interesting one that way. Data and information uh, life cycle for security. Uh, I don't think there is uh, any doubt about the data security playing a very important part. Uh, but within uh, the API asset management and the data touched by API, this is, uh, this is definitely an aspect that you want to pay attention to. And uh, then GRM are specifically the governance and risk management requirements. Uh, we've touched uh, on that previously. Uh, in many cases, these are more best practices today uh, rather than uh, requirements associated with specific compliance controls. Uh, but moving forward, uh, this, might, uh, this might change. Uh, so uh, map the CSI, uh, CSA requirements to what uh, you have within your industry. And, and then of course it's, uh, situation specific, whether you want to follow all the recommendations of the Cloud Security Alliance uh, or uh, pick and choose the ones that are applicable to you. Uh, another great source uh, of uh, looking at specific compliance controls uh, is uh, uh, NIST, Network Center, uh, uh, National Center of Security. Uh, and uh, those uh, requirements are also more prescriptive than something you might see in industry-specific situations like uh, HIPAA. 
important if you are audited, uh, describing to the auditor how you're implementing the recommendations, more, more the principal recommendations provided uh, by your industry vertical compliance regulation. Uh, something like NIST or CSA controls would be very helpful in that regard. Uh, principle three, uh, implement and enforce change policy. We have touched on the change policy because it is one of the compliance requirements uh, and controls within the CSA uh, uh, set. Uh, but specifically uh, within, uh, within your environment, change policy is one of the very important aspects here. Uh, what to, do you look for uh, when you define your change policy? Uh, API versioning is the first thing that you want to address here. And this is not a small change in a parameter. That is, this is typically a larger change implementing significant new functionality within your APIs. Uh, uh, looking at perhaps uh, changing the version of the protocol that it depends on uh, or, or starting to address uh, completely new types of the data. In all these cases, you, or you want clear understanding of when uh, the version of the API has changed and uh, how it has changed. Uh, the change management is mostly around the workflows and the personnel. Uh, if your application is moving from other previous versions of the APIs to the next, uh, who should be able to uh, document uh, what constitutes the change and approve uh, that, uh, uh, the change for it to go forward? How frequently are you allowing changes? How are you notifying the customers if that uh, uh, if the change goes forward? Uh, do you have any partners who are using your APIs? And uh, what are your contractual obligations and SLAs uh, for making that notification? Uh, uh, is a specific testing requirement uh, on the new API for both functional performance and security. So all of those uh, things would need to be a part of the change management policy. Uh, interestingly, uh, just having a document that says what uh, the change management policy should be uh, doesn't guarantee that this policy is met. Uh, most organizations have uh, many people involved in both APIs and uh, creating, operating, testing, and deprecating APIs. Uh, so automated detection of what the actual API is, and uh, if it has changed from the last time that was assessed, uh, is a big part of this. And this is, of course, the monitoring. And uh, here, because APIs are very, very plentiful, you probably want to pay more attention to the APIs with high risk scores and uh, verify that the change approval and other change policies has been followed, especially for the risky APIs, even if that requires uh, some additional manual steps. Survey. Uh, conformance analysis is an interesting, interesting part of the uh, and it actually helps with change detection quite a bit. Uh, it also helps in discovering if you have uh, shadow or orphan APIs. And the essence of this analysis is uh, uh, having the developers uh, upload uh, the existing documented APIs. And uh, then if there is a system that auto detects your APIs, uh, you can easily compare uh, the specifications that is uploaded with what is already detected. So if some of the APIs are not documented, you will immediately see uh, those endpoints. If some APIs have um, 
parameters that are not documented or the documented parameters have a discrepancy with what's actually on the wire uh, that will show up as well and uh, those gaps is uh, what will feed into uh, the risk scoring and risk analysis in addition to uh, things like likelihood of a particular API endpoint being attacked or a potential impact uh, of, uh, of that um, uh, API if that attack is successful. And within the risk monitoring, the, others, the other thing that uh, you want to understand is whether APIs are vulnerable. Those existing vulnerabilities may be uh, more or less risky. And of course, this uh, risky vulnerability is discovered uh, that our ownership that we have established when we talked about the API catalog will make it easier to uh, direct your development team uh, to uh, go ahead and remediate that vulnerability within the next development cycle. And uh, then last but uh, not least principle uh, is to monitor for deviations uh, and introduce compensating controls or otherwise remediate issues. Of course, filing a ticket uh, for developers to remove the vulnerabilities from the API uh, or a patch a platform level uh, that potentially has security problems uh, that is one of the uh, most reliable ways to remediate. Uh, before you know what to remediate, uh, you need to make sure that your monitoring uh, is comprehensive. Uh, monitoring includes several steps in and of itself. You want to configure what you're monitoring. Of course, the considerations here is how much of your monitoring is automated and how much of that requires manual intervention. Uh, so depending on the level of automations and level of information aggregation in your monitoring tools, you may want to uh, also configure monitoring frequency. Uh, perhaps uh, you, you have uh, exhaustive monitoring uh, at some uh, periodic intervals that are high intervals uh, and then uh, critical assets are monitored uh, at a higher frequency and uh, on critical assets you may want to set uh, to send alerts to your security engineers on call as opposed to uh, perhaps less critical APIs that uh, can be reported on on a daily or weekly basis. In, uh, then in addition to uh, monitoring, it's always helpful uh, to have periodic testing for compliance with your policies. This would be uh, active, uh, active testing uh, on uh, the settings around your requests and response to the APIs. Uh, all of uh, all of this, both testing and monitoring, works best uh, if it's uh, predetermined and runs on a, a well-known cycle. Of course, here we have CI/CD tools that are extremely helpful. Uh, already have uh, triggered and scheduled uh, scheduled runs. Uh, continuous delivery uh, is very helpful around running monitoring tools and generating reports uh, based on that. Uh, so definitely use what you have. Most of us already have CICDs in place. Uh, so extremely, extremely helpful to integrate your monitoring and testing into that application lifecycle driven by CICD. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to uh, to wrap up uh, with an example of an extremely successful API governance program uh, implemented by Veterans Administration. So here, uh, what they have uh, done is established the catalog and uh, grouped the applications, the APIs by the applications, 
as uh, what we talked about in our first principle. The applications that they have implemented are uh, API governance around uh, our maps, contacts, language processing, social media integration, and uh, speech to text. So uh, they have identified the APIs. And here we see that uh, uh, before the program was instituted, they had disparate sources uh, of the uh, information about the APIs uh, from logs, from APMs, from gateways. Obviously, all of this would produce APIs in inconsistent formats and would require a lot of manual data gathering here. After the program was implemented, that catalog function was uh, automated and normalized. And that's exactly what you want to do. Uh, have uh, all the APIs in the consistent format, uh, have risk assessment associated with APIs for prioritization, and have centralized uh, uh, reporting on those APIs as a part of a catalog. Then uh, uh, the other element of the program uh, is uh, uh, discovery and tracking. And of course, uh, Veterans Administration is a government entity, so the compliance part of that requirement is very obvious and uh, it may not be listed here, uh, but it is a big part of uh, what is fed into uh, the um, the contents and the parameters of this successful program. And, and then uh, uh, policy and change management as was implemented by license and audit management, as well as uh, uh, budgeting that uh, uh, that go into, into that policy, including uh, budgeting for the services uh, that are implemented with APIs. Uh, so, uh, following following that example, most of uh, our other folks who have the APIs can also implement this for easy principles uh, that I have mentioned, and uh, bring the uh, APIs and the API-driven applications into compliance. And of course, traceable can help you in this endeavor. Uh, our customers already have uh, API catalog in the form of uh, API discovery, uh, in complete, uh, complete with uh, API specifications, uh, open API spec that way, uh, and risk assessment. Uh, so by implementing traceable, you uh, immediately jump past the first principle and uh, your API catalog is available uh, right away. Um, compliance part, unfortunately, that one you'll have to do for yourself. Uh, traceable doesn't know what industry you're in, uh, so you will have to understand what is applicable in your environment. Uh, but once you know that, uh, you can use other features of traceable, uh, like uh, service uh, categorization, uh, service uh, ownership assignment, uh, monitoring for sensitive data, uh, you can use uh, all of that information to uh, then map what needs to be monitored and uh, what uh, change policy you uh, want to implement based on your existing compliance requirements. And uh, then from there, uh, Traceable can help you uh, with monitoring the API usage insights. Uh, monitoring the API changes and finding orphan APIs there. Uh, so uh, definitely welcome you uh, you to try out Traceable and see how we can help with your API governance program. Great, thank you very much, Renata, for sharing all of this great information about the importance of API governance and how to get it started with better management of those better APIs. Uh, with that, we'll move on to our Q&A portion of the webinar. All right, so it looks like we have a question here. Renata, what do I need to discover about APIs that I don't already have with my gateways? From, I guess it's from my gateways. Uh, if you have gateways, uh, API gateways, you are probably ahead of the game. 
uh, on many situations. Uh, gateways are great tools that help you both uh, formalize uh, what uh, you document about APIs uh, and control things like metering, authentication, and so on. The greatest challenge is most organizations are not uniformly on gateways, uh, or they have different gateways implemented in different portions of the organizations. Uh, like you've seen in the Veterans Affairs um, uh, uh, use case. Uh, they had gateways in some cases, but to have a uniform, complete catalog, you need to supplement that uh, with the APIs that are not on gateways, either the legacy APIs or perhaps the internal APIs implemented by some open source software. Uh, so uh, firstly, what you need to discover beyond the gateways are the APIs that are not on the gateways. And uh, then the secondly, uh, uh, there are uh, change management, change control, uh, and uh, usage patterns of the APIs uh, that are difficult to extract from the gateways. So that's the other part uh, that you can get with monitoring, but not necessarily from the gateway directly. Hope that answers it. Indeed, thank you. Uh, very detailed answer. Um, great. Next one we have. Um, do I have to? So, am I required? I guess to comply with the CSA requirements. A great question. Then, uh, is computer security alliance is very helpful because it's prescriptive. Uh, they can explain, and they do explain. Uh, how to meet uh, uh, requirements in the area of uh, authentication or discovery uh, or uh, vulnerability controls. Uh, so in that, in that sense, uh, uh, when you go to your auditor and say, we have controls uh, of our APIs in the areas of, of audit, uh, what are these controls? Uh, at the same time, Security Alliance, Cloud Security Alliance is not a prescriptive body. What you have to do is typically uh, described within your industry. Uh, if you are in uh, e-commerce or, or payment or banking industry, you probably have to follow PCI DSS. If you are in healthcare industry, you will look at the high trust or HIPAA requirements. And uh, in some cases, they will tell you exactly uh, what's going on. Like um, uh, PCI uh, 6.2 will tell you to implement application security controls. But in some cases, uh, especially HIPAA is notorious for that. Uh, all that, the, uh, what you have to do, will say, is you have to implement adequate controls in a certain area like audit. And this is where CSA controls are extremely helpful then you can say, oh, within the audit in my cloud environment, uh, these are the community recommended uh, adequate controls for that area. And this is how I can meet my mandated HIPAA requirements. So that's the benefit of CSA. You don't have to, but you would be well served to follow those. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a smart thing to check out then. Um, so, okay, here it is. Here's the question that everyone's got in the back of their mind, even if they're not actually asking it. If we start implementing API governance, won't it slow down my future delivery? Ooh. Your thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> I know we're coming up on Halloween, and that is a scary question at uh, every security professional's uh, top of mind. Uh, if I implement anything uh, that helps me uh, formalize or implement or tighten down my security controls? Would that slow down my feature delivery? Interestingly, uh, now that we are in situations where uh, development and operations and security operations are all combined in a single DevSecOps uh, uh, situation, I personally think that the proper API governance will actually speed up your feature delivery rather than slowing it down. Uh, and I know it's a controversial argument here, uh, but if you don't have to do multiple cycles for fixing and backtracking and rolling back 
uh, to previous releases, once later on it's discovered uh, that they are um, not compliant or the changes in one place contradicts the change in another place, uh, or uh, the uh, data flow on the risky API uh, has resulted in violations of internal policies, uh, the lack of reduced churn uh, is what is going to help you have both more confidence and a better uh, ratio of uh, consistent delivery of features into production. Uh, so uh, maybe initially while you start working with your developers and just putting this in place, uh, there would be little bump, but once the program is in place, I strongly believe that it will help uh, delivery into production of consistent quality features at a consistent uh, fast pace. And traceable can help. Uh, uh, then, uh, Mike, you're on mute. Oh, I did it. I was trying to not have that happen. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's uh, how about that. We can't help. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's also like one of the steps towards, you know, having the governance, which is like knowing what your inventory is, right? And being able to see all of the APIs and how they work. Um, just that alone can help uh, uh, development and, and moving faster, right? And with more confidence as well. Uh, absolutely. Um, so, uh, on those four principles that I described, uh, traceable can uh, uh, help with the first principle, like Dan was saying, uh, creating a catalog of all the APIs. Uh, so we pretty much will help close uh, that part for you. And principle number four, uh, monitoring the um, deviations and making sure that compensating controls are in place, we can help with that as well. Great stuff. Okay, we've got one last question I think that, that we haven't responded to. Uh, so I've heard that API specifications can be generated from code. I guess we're talking like open API. Is it good enough? Does this provide change control? I guess from the government's perspective. Uh, that's that's a great question, and uh, in many cases, especially when you're coding to an API gateway, some level of API specification can definitely be generated from the code. Uh, the trick here is that Open API spec uh, only requires uh, the uh, method and the query parameters of the API. Uh, it does not require you to go into the details of the uh, body of the API, uh, the parameters, especially if they're nested, and the restrictions on the parameters types. Uh, that uh, uh, often is insufficient uh, in terms of the full details of the, of the APIs, uh, as well as uh, the requirements that you're going to see from various compliance bodies. Uh, uh, change control is uh, another uh, problem that you're going to see there. Uh, even if you continue to generate uh, the API spec from your code, uh, APIs are very fluid. So if uh, uh, there are no specific analysis tools that can help you understand the drift uh, between the documented API specs from one version to the next, or from one check-in to the next, uh, that uh, uh, will create ever-growing bodies of uh, um, uh, versions of incomplete open API specs uh, that are very hard to manage. Uh, so uh, yes, possible, uh, best practice, not really. Yep, sounds like, uh, sounds like there's more we can do there, so great. Uh, all right, with that, we're going to wrap up this webinar. Thank you, Renata, for sharing your wisdom with us, as always. Uh, to our audience, thank you for joining us, and we hope you'll join us again soon. Uh, you can find more webinars like this on our Bright Talk channel, both uh, previous and new upcoming webinars. Uh, please check it out. Thank you, and have a good rest of your day or evening.